All right, so we made it through the, the six of the ten biblical <laughs> principles for uh, establishing a discipleship culture last week. If you did not have notes from last week, I think we have up here uh, some of them all folded, uh, beginning with uh, number seven, where we'll be at today. Did anybody not get these or doesn't have these? Uh, the new set of notes on the floor is our next section. That's what we're going to focus on today, but this is what we're going to finish up. Anybody need those? Sure. Okay, now we've got people willing to admit it. Yeah. Uh, that means you didn't bring your papers back, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pick up with number seven and jump right in. So, uh, number seven, discipleship is not complete without an understanding of the cost of following Jesus. So we talked about this uh, big picture last week where we were, we were asking what is the central ministry of the church? You know, there are lots of ministries, but we said all of those are designed for us to be able to engage and find our place in the ministry of the church, which is helping people find and follow Christ, making disciples of Jesus. And so that's really important. Maybe that was new for you. Maybe you thought, well, my ministry is this or my ministry is that. And ministry gets fleshed out in a lot of different ways. But what we're saying is the ministry, the capital M of the church, is making disciples. The thing that everything else should be in concert with one another in is seeing people grow in their love for Christ. And then we've been asking the question, well, if I'm starting to help another person grow, what, what do I need to think about? What, what sort of categories, you know, I don't want to do an incomplete job. And, and so I'm trying to give some broad categories for we need to think in all of these areas. You're, we, we all have strengths, and to some degree our, the, our strength in following Jesus will be what we most often want to pass on to other people, what we're going to focus on talking about. So, so if you are a, a theology, Bible knowledge person, when you're discipling other people, you're going to give them intellectual books. You're going to be thinking about those aspects of things and focus entirely on those. But you might forget about certain other important aspects of the faith. Practicing spiritual disciplines and the role of community and relationships in the body of Christ. Well, your discipleship in that person's life and theirs and yours, uh, if we just focus on our strengths, are going to leave us complete. They're not going to fill out the whole picture. So that's what we're working on right now. Number seven reminds us that discipleship is not complete without an understanding of the cost of following Jesus. Let's look at Luke chapter 14, 26 through 33 there in your notes. Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So this is about prioritizing following Jesus over everything else. This is what Jesus is talking about. Look at how he fleshes that out then. For which of you... Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So, he's, so what he's doing is he's saying, there's a cost to following me. And the cost is that it has to become the, the primary focus of your life. And then he says, count that cost. Before you identify as a follower of Christ, count that cost. And if you're going to identify as a follower of Christ, know that that cost exists. And you are going to need to count it at the beginning. And so helping people understand the cost of it is, is to, to help them reprioritize their lives. So he talks about a person who's, uh, who doesn't count the cost before starting a building task. But then he says, what king, going out to encounter another king in war... We're not first sit down and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Wow, I mean, Jesus is telling us that there's this <laughs> immense cost of discipleship that we have to help one another count. And so we may begin following Christ, and respond to the gospel and begin walking in Christ, not realizing how much it costs. And so part of our discipleship is really early on to help people realize you're going to encounter moments in your life where, where the cost to follow Jesus is going to be great. Now's the time to count that cost. Now's the time to begin to think about that. Um, if we're not careful, we'll go about our work of making disciples much like a life coach, working with others to improve their plans. 
uh, Jesus, of course, had something more substantial in mind. In disciple making, we're not only attempting to connect with one another and connect with the practical wisdom for life, but to entirely reorganize our lives around the calling and purpose of Jesus. In Luke 14, Jesus pictures the cost of discipleship with three pictures that I've already mentioned a little bit, but let's just think about what these pictures tell us. Consider that Jesus is calling his disciples to a transfer of loyalty that will shake up the fundamental relationships of life. You know, this transfer of loyalty, he says, goes as far as our family relationships. So our loyalty to Christ becomes our primary family relationship. And all the other ones become subservient to them. They, over, they, they, may, they may fit underneath it, but to the degree that they challenge us not to follow Christ, they have to come underneath the submission and authority of Jesus. And so, uh, so Jesus uses the deepest relationship that we consider blood family and says, following me <coughs> is about seeing your life reorganized where, where when it, if the choice ever comes up, will I follow Jesus or will I follow my family? I'm going to follow Jesus. So he, so he says it that way, a transfer of loyalty that shakes up the fundamental relationships of your life, a lifetime project that will require the dedication of your most important resources. Think about the story he tells about the man who uh, decides to build this tower, right? He wants us to understand that discipleship is a lifelong project that is going to require the primary resources, and we need to, to ask ourselves, am I willing to devote myself? When we're helping other people, we need to help them come to grips with, are you willing to devote yourself in the resources of your life to following Christ and living for his kingdom? This is, this is Jesus' picture of the cost of discipleship. It's an important question for each of us personally, isn't it? You know, have I counted the cost of following Christ? When I think about the fundamental resources of my life, do I see them devoted to the work of the kingdom? And Jesus says that we are experiencing in this call, he's calling his disciples to a strategic battle that will call for complete resolve to be victorious. To sit down and, and, and realize it may be, there may be times where it's 10,000 against 20,000. And, you know, and am I ready to go out into that battle? And, and so that's the, those are questions. The truth is, we are not preparing people in discipleship if they are not pressed to consider if Jesus is a brother worth losing all of their family for. We're not preparing people if they're not pressed to consider whether God's kingdom is worth our entire life resources to advance. We're not preparing people in discipleship if they're not pressed to consider whether life under any other king would be eternally satisfying. That's the question that we have to help people ask. So number seven, we need to count the cost. Number eight, discipleship is not complete without a firm grasp of the gospel and basic doctrine. So partly we've got to talk about counting the cost of life, resources, but also we've got to help people gain a firm grasp of the gospel and basic doctrine. Not just one where they can identify it if they hear it, but one that where they can grip it and apply it to their own lives. And, and so we see uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is about taking the things that have been taught and being able to grip them, but not, he doesn't say just so that you can hear and identify them when another person is expressing them. That our responsibility in discipleship is about being able to take hold of those so that we can enjoy the grace of Christ in our own life, right? I don't always need a teacher. And so that we could help another person gain a grasp of the gospel and its implications in their life in that same way. And so this is what it looks like for us to go on in discipleship and what it is we're trying to pass on. So if I'm thinking, you know, am I, disciple, am I doing a good job discipling others? I'm not just thinking, are they making some progress in generally being obedient to Jesus? I'm asking the question, are they owning and understanding the, the basics of the gospel and the doctrines of the faith in a way that they can also teach and train others? That's the maturity of discipleship that we're looking for. So if the church is a factory for making disciples, then the gospel is the blueprint that sets the design. We've been using that factory analogy. And so having a good grasp of the design of the product, of the designs and blueprints that help us do that is, is entirely important. The doctrine of the church is like the machines that churn out the various parts. The members of the church are like skilled workers who know how to wield the design and the machines to be effective for working in 
in the, in the making of disciples. So our, since our goal is not to just help others grow for their own sake, but reach a maturity where they can in turn help others do the same, it's important that we help move people from recognizing the gospel and sound doctrine if they hear it, to being able to articulate it themselves. So I think it's important for you to ask yourself where you're at on that spectrum. Am I, am I a person who can rejoice in and recognize the gospel when someone else is describing it? That's a good thing. It's, a, it's a place, an important place to be. Am I a, a person who can take those gospel truths, remember them, and, and apply them to my life and work through my problems? Uh, can, do I have enough grasp to distinguish between maybe worldly wisdom and how the gospel actually plays out in my relationships or in my life? And then the, the other category might be, am I able, do I have enough grasp where I can help someone else see that, where I can help someone else take hold of that, um, where I can help other people grow? There's another, another category, one last category, can I help others learn to help others grow? See, so, so if you think about your maturity that way, you realize all of us have work to do in this area of growth and discipleship, but that's the work we're trying to also do for other people. And so... Discipleship is not complete without a firm grasp of the gospel and basic doctrine. We need to be convinced that doctrine matters. One of the, last week when I talked about the high aim of discipleship, I said it's, a, it's worked out in love, isn't it? It's the pinnacle, last week I said, of discipleship is helping us learn to love well in the relationships God has given us. But we need to understand that doctrine matters in that process. What you believe uh, deep down in your soul about who God is, and about the gospel, and about who you are as a person, and the things the Bible teach about those basic things are incredibly important. And that's doctrine, that's teaching, that's about applying our intellect to understanding uh, what the Bible teaches and how to distinguish truth from error. There's a trend in churches to say things like our knowledge surpasses our obedience. Have you ever heard that? How many of you said, oh, the problem isn't so much that we don't know things, it's that our knowledge is so far ahead of our obedience. Well, I understand the hunger for obedience. I want our church to be obedient. I want individuals in our church to be obedient. But the truth is, we're not doing people any favors by leaving them unable to discern sound teaching. The ability to do so is critical for shaping our own hearts and minds to live for and desire the kingdom of God. We have not made disciples if people can barely recognize the gospel in our church and cannot distinguish between sound teaching and error. Gaining a firm grasp on the gospel and doctrine creates new categories and language for our hearts. And here's Here's what you need to understand, is that this, this idea that our obedience surpasses our knowledge is actually foolish. You don't really know the gospel well if it's not currently impacting your obedience. You're only, you, you might have a general, you don't, you don't know the depths of it, you don't know the importance of it, you don't understand the details of it well enough. And actually you do need a, a deepening and sound doctrine and understanding of who you are. Your, your doctrinal categories are not filled out if they are if you're not seeing obedience come forth from that. Now, I've seen dry, dusty doctrinal presentations, but there is a connection between doctrine and practice that is vital, and we have to feed both. Um, gaining a firm grasp on the gospel, gospel and doctrine creates new categories and language for our hearts and minds to understand our experiences. One of the things I, I'm doing regularly in discipling others and and pastoring others is helping giving give them new categories through which they can see the experiences of their life biblically. And without those categories, that's doctrine, that's teaching. Without those categories, they're unable to do that. Uh, let me give you an example of that. For example, when some people look under the hood of a car, they see three categories, right? They see metal, rubber things, and plastic things. That, who's with me? I got some people, right? Rubber, metal things, and plastic things. Well, you'll never become an expert in car care without adding some detail to your categories. Right? You better, you better come to understand some other things. You better understand how the different parts that other people know and I can't name off the top of my head uh, work in it together. If you want to become good at assessing cars, fixing cars, understanding how to build a car. Well, in the same way, we're, you know, remaining doctrinally vague about the gospel and the central teaching of Christianity will not lead to increased expertise in dealing with your own heart. And so for us, learning doctrine, learning the scriptures well, is about having new categories that come forth in our mind. And now when I have an experience, I begin to see it through a different lens. And I have the categories to be able to understand what's going on. So discipleship is not complete without a firm grasp of the gospel 
and basic doctrine. Number nine, discipleship is not complete without a commitment to the local church. Discipleship is not complete without a commitment to the local church. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 21 through 25. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, listen to the verbs. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Who's not to neglect to meet together? We are not to neglect to meet together. As is the habit of some. Right? I mean, is that a habit of some even still? Even people say, I'm a Christian, and they have no relationships with the body of Christ in a way that's going to see them work those relations, work their faith out with one another, be stirred together, be reminded of the gospel regularly. Yeah, I mean, I meet people all the time who say, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to the church. Well, that's interesting. You're a better Christian than the Bible Christians. Uh, that's not possible. The truth is, uh, I've, I've met very few, very few mature and impassioned Christians who are not heavily involved in relationship with other Christians in the spirit of the law and the I, I, you know, There may be a unicorn out there. I realize all of you might go, well, I met this one guy who didn't see that much place in the church. Yeah, that's great, but, but most people can't. I, I, that doesn't work for them. And it doesn't happen for them. And, honestly, it, it's an incomplete sense of discipleship, isn't it? Because the body of Christ is where we also exercise together the work of the mission. And, and so when, when we're thinking about that, we have to make a case for that. In, in a very individualistic society that is done with institutions, we have to help people see why they're so that's uh, it's important for us to think about. Assembling rather regular with other Christians for worship, studying the scriptures, prayer, accountability, encouragement, and mission advancement is not simply a helpful add-on for growing Christians. It is one of the major ways that the Christian life moves from theory to practice. People have all sorts of arguments and reasons for neglecting the local church and justifying it. But let me just give you one small case for you. If you are a freelance Christian, you get to choose who you spend time with and love. If you're committed to the body of Christ, you have to love the people you're with. Much harder. You know, if I'm a freelance Christian, I find people I identify with most, I spend time with them. If I commit to a body of Christ and say, every one of you, I, I'm taking responsibility for how we encourage each of you. <coughs> then when I run into difficult relationships, difficult personalities, difficult situations, I don't get to just leave. And see, that's, a, that's, that's what a body of believers does. That's what seeing the family of God in the local church does it challenges me to move beyond my own self-interest in discipleship and growth with Christ. And we need to help others understand the value of that as well. One way of think about it, uh, thinking about it is to say that Christianity is a team sport. It really is a team sport. Imagine if a person described himself as an NFL football player while not being associated with an actual team. Right? I'm an NFL football player. Maybe they would explain that they do all the same type of workouts, have the same level of skills, so it really doesn't make a difference. Even so, they would not be an NFL player, would they? No. Even if they're as skilled as current NFL players, even if they seemingly possess a high level of this skill, the actual activity of being an NFL football player can only be done with other players and accomplished as they work together on a team to win games. So we hold our confession together, we stir up love together, we encourage together, the way we do all of that together is by committing regularly to be with one another. That's why here in Hebrews 10, he encourages them not to leave off meeting together in a committed, <coughs> covenanted way with one another. So, that's important. Discipleship is not complete without a commitment to the local church. And then last, discipleship is not complete without a desire for the gospel to reach all peoples. Say that again, it's very technical language, and I will help you see why I chose the words. Because we usually don't say, I want the gospel to reach all peoples, right? That sounds grammatically incorrect. But actually, the Bible tells us that as disciples, we should want to see the gospel reach all peoples. Matthew chapter 28 again, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Every disciple of Jesus needs to have their vision for his mission expanded by a close study of Scripture and a better understanding of the Great Commission. Our work in encouraging one another should lead us to consider how we fit in the overall mission of Christ, and I want, it, I want that to be defined for you. As we mentioned above, we're not just making disciples in the church. I, I do want to say that this is a question I've had a lot. Is this about us helping one another grow, or is this about seeing other people come to Christ and grow? And the answer is yes. 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 <laughs> Amen. Right. Now, here, here's, my, here's one of my beliefs is if we are doing balanced discipleship with one another, that includes the call for the gospel to reach all nations, then we are going in our discipleship, we must be helping one another own the responsibility we have in church, as a church to see the gospel planted in places where it's scarce. So there, there's no real discipleship of a great commission sort that says we just focus on inward discipleship. Because for many of us, the thing that, that we need to be able to do is take a grip on the gospel and help contend for it in places where others have not heard it. That is discipleship. And, and so sometimes our discipleship is to disciple one another in mission. Okay? The, 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 the Great Commission says that this is our charge. Our charge is to all nations. And that's, that's, that phrase is uh, in the Greek is panta ta ethne, to every ethnicity, every people group on the earth. That means the assignment of this church is to make disciples among all nations. For us to hear the call of Christ and say, we're not discipling one another well, if in our growing together, we're not also pressing some of us out. Now we trust the Holy Spirit to do that in calling, don't we? But we also have to use the means of the gospel to remind ourselves that the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Not my quote. I heard it somewhere. It's really good. <laughs> David Platt, probably. Uh, so, so we're not just making disciples in the church. We're making disciples of other people. But both of them are important. So one of my desires for this class is is that we use the church as a grounds in which we become we become skilled at doing discipleship with one another and maybe those who are less mature in our midst. So that also we can take the leap to doing discipleship among the nations and among the people God has placed in our neighborhoods. So that we, we have some framework for how we can interact with people about the gospel. And, and that we can also see the, the just manifold ways that God gives us to do that among the people that he's placed us around in our neighborhoods. Among the people in this city, in this region, and in the world. You know, I say this. I don't think I say it enough uh, because it's what I think about all the time. What I most dream about for this church is that we would be a disciple-making people among the nations. That God would call people out continually who have skills to do this because they practiced it in the context of their local church, in their local setting, and can then dream about other people who have not heard the gospel, who don't have access to people who are pursuing them, and that, that, that we would count the cost of the kingdom so much that we would say, it's worth everything for me to take my work over into that part of the field and make sure other people have a chance to hear about Christ. And we are not doing good discipleship with one another if it's not causing us to continually think about those who have not heard about Christ. So when I think about discipleship, why am I motivated for this? It's about skilled workers in ministry here who can then envision themselves doing it other places. And I want you to think about that. And so we may start with one another and may see that in our neighborhoods. And we want to see that in other places where the gospel is not available to people. And those places do exist. Listen, if, you're, if you have not understood the, the world well enough yet at this point to understand that there are people in the world who have never heard about Jesus at all. And there's no one in their community trying to tell them about it. Those people live all over parts of this world. And it's our responsibility as the Church of Christ to be mobilized to reach them. And I just want to say, when I evaluate the heart of American churches, we have all the resources necessary to do it, and very little motivation in there. I, we have all the resources necessary. There should be a people group on earth that isn't being pursued by Christians who love the gospel. So we have to ask ourselves a question, how, how, we, how we lack discipleship in our churches? Today, uh, millions of people are going to gather in churches all across the United States, and very few of them are going to think 
what are we doing to reaching the remaining 20 people groups who live in Nepal? Now, 20 unreached people groups, language groups who, in their language, nobody can, nobody is a Christian who is sharing the gospel. What are we doing about that? And that's just one example. Of the place. So we want to, we want to care about that. We want to be driven by that, and make sure we understand that discipleship is not complete without us taking that work seriously. All right. So I want to move now to 10 basic practices for cultivating a discipleship culture in the local church. So that those, those are our biblical principles. I've tried to lay out kind of a broad idea of why it matters, of what we need to be thinking about underneath, of you to have, have some uh, biblical concepts that would drive you to say, you know what, I'm not just going to listen in this course. I need to find out how to move to action. Um, now I want to talk about general practices that you should be thinking about if you want to increase multiplication. When I was writing these, here's, here's what I was thinking about. I, I was thinking, how do we begin with where we're at as, as people? Uh, how do we help fuel one another's growth in the midst of the church? And, and, and I'm aware that all the time that we have people who attend and are part of the church who are not walking faithfully with Christ, who are not Christians. And how do, we, how do we go from me thinking about that a lot to a whole group of people every Sunday morning wondering if the person sitting in the chair next to them knows Christ and is growing in their faith? That's, what, that's my vision, right? That, that, that when, when if, you, if you're a member of this church and you're sitting there on Sunday morning and you don't know the person in your row, you're asking yourself the question, I wonder if this young man knows Christ and is walking with him. And I do not want him to come in and out of here today without a chance of finding that out. Isn't that what we want? Amen. And, and so, so, so just for me, it's been about how, how do we get, get to a point where, that, where it's impossible to come to our church this is a low bar in my mind, right? This isn't even about going into our neighborhood yet, right? Yeah. How do we make it impossible to come to our church without not just hearing the gospel message from the front, but other people in my life concerned about my progress in the gospel? That's what I want. And, and, uh, and this, these, these practices were written, I think, mostly with that as a starting point and can help equip us to go beyond that. Um, Ten basic practices for cultivating a discipleship culture in the local church. Mark Dever's book, Discipling, which I there are copies on the back table if you want one, and you promise you'll read it, pick it up. It's the back table at the church. You can just take it. Don't worry about paying for it, but only take it if you're going to read it. Page 68, 69, the local church describes it as this father-designed, Jesus-authorized, and spirit-gifted body is far better equipped to undertake the work of discipling believers than simply you or your one friend. So what I want you to see is, all the things we try to do here at the church are about creating a climate where there are lots of tools where you can walk alongside someone and see them grow in their faith. Okay? That that's, that's a better environment for helping someone grow in their faith than if you alone that were the only way that they're going to be reminded of the gospel, encouraged in it, challenged by it, explained it, uh, so, so, that's it. so it's important for us to, to think about that. Jesus does not promise that you and your one friend will defeat the gates of hell. He promises that the church will do this together. So here's number one, be aware. Be aware. Pastors and church members often have two entirely different experiences when it comes to the need for discipleship in the local church. I just described to you, uh, to me, a, a vision of an ideal church member going to church on Sunday. <laughs> that when the, the people in their row, they're thinking, I wonder if they know and are following Christ. Like, like that, that may be a first new awareness for you. That, that, that is a bullseye <laughs> in, in my head as a pastor. Uh, but it's, it's important that we are aware, that we raise our awareness. A church member, member may look around and wonder, who would I connect with for something like this? And I've had people ask me the question over the last week, like, if, if I'm going to do this kind of stuff, you know, how do I find a person? And, and I'm sitting there going, how do you not find a person? Like that's that's the other that's my side of the picture. Your side of the picture is I can't see them, and my picture is I only see them. You know, that's every person I want to see them in vital relationships where they're growing in their faith and being challenged to take the next steps in discipleship. That means every week there's lots of people that we could be in a relationship like this with. We'll talk more about that, but I want us to become more aware. Pastors want to see an increase in people being challenged not to be content with where they are at and are aware and to become aware of immature attenders 
non-Christian believers, unbelievers that would benefit from the personal challenge for a relationship with you. The first thing you can do is begin to pray for awareness of the need for evangelism and growth in the lives of individuals that attend the church. Become personally interested in those around you and discover where they're at spiritually. Take time to think about those who God has placed around you and consider how you might steward the relationships that are already in progress. You know, it, it's, it's not even an awkward conversation once you decide to do it. You say, hey, what's your background? Like, have, you, have you gone to church a lot? Is this, is this your first time here? Or have you been coming here a while? Finding out where people are at, trying to understand. It's not an awkward conversation if you just ask questions and let them talk. So they're thinking, I want to understand how this, where this person's at. But, but we need to become aware. Second, make a plan. So the first practice is be aware, become aware. The second one is make a plan. Discipling is a relationship, Mark Dever says in the same book, in which we seek to do spiritual good for someone by initiating, teaching, correcting, modeling, loving, humbling ourselves, counseling, and influencing. Most people who recognize the value of peer-to-peer -peer discipleship stop short of engaging in the practical work because they have never made a plan about how they can personally carry it forward. So, so I use a term there that I want to underline a little bit. Um, you might want to write down peer-to-peer -peer discipleship. Uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I, I, that's the language that I want to use here because it's never, it's never readily apparent who is more mature and who is less mature. Um, and so sometimes I think the initiation of discipleship relationships doesn't happen because most of you think, what do I have to offer? What I, I can't do this. I don't know how to pastor small pe people. I don't, I don't have the skill set for that. And, and so uh, most people are sitting there thinking, I'm not, I'm not able to do that. And often they overlap in the same, the same frame they would be somewhat offended if someone came to them and said, I want to mentor you. Right? And, then, and then they'd be like, what makes you think you're more mature than I am? Right? That's a dynamic that exists in human relationships. We both feel un incompetent, and we feel prideful enough that we never want to see the other person coming to us as more competent. And it really doesn't matter. And, and the truth is, discipleship is so multifaceted that there may be areas where you are strong and the other person uh, is weak. And, and you'll find out that although they're not as far along in their maturity, they have some strengths that you don't have. Now, I've seen, I've met some very effectively evangelistic new believers. And uh, I've met some people who've known Christ for 20 years and never led someone to Christ. Oh gosh, I've seen both of those things. Do you think those two people could benefit from a relationship with one another where they spur one another on to love and good deeds? Does it really matter who has more life maturity? All we need is initiators. So when I use the language peer-to-peer -peer discipleship, what I'm trying to create through this time is initiators of peer-to-peer -peer discipleship. And we don't have to worry about who's ahead, right? So, uh, so, so that means you can say, you know, I want this for me and for other people enough that I, I'm going to take these things that I'm learning here I'm going to start to initiate some relationships with one like that. I'm going to find the ways that I can make sure that if somebody said, who are you discipling? Who are you in a discipleship relationship with? I can say, this is who it is. And, uh, and that, that's, that's important for us to think about. So we need to make a plan. Most people never make a plan about how they can personally carry it forward. Here are a couple aspects of a simple plan that you can develop to move you from recognizing the need to be engaged in the work. You need to be able, like with this plan, you should be able to take it in a notebook and write down, here's my plan right now for being involved in discipleship relationships. Uh, you need to gather the tools, right? You need to like, what are we gonna do that, like, in terms of content and reading and studying? If I have somebody who I'm working with to help grow, how, you know, what do I need to bring to the table as far as tools? Because they may say, okay, we're gonna get together, and then you sit there, and there you are at Starbucks, the table's empty, right? Or uh, something like that, and you're like, what do you wanna talk about? Got any problem? Yeah, I'm okay. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> kind of okay. <laughs> My house is on fire, but I'm good. What, what's your prayer? Well, I got an aunt who's kind of struggling with the owl. <laughs> we don't naturally immediately start engaging in things, do we? And a structured content helps us begin to 
encourage one another in areas that bring up the things that we can help with that are more personal. And so uh, we want to gather tools, figure out what resources you will use to get started. There are a number of good discipleship guides and books that can be helpful starters for, dis for discipleship. But uh, by, by next Sunday, I will have the first 10 sessions complete of something that I'm just going to set, try to provide blanket cover for everybody and say, we want every person in our church to have walked through these 10 sessions with another person. And so you'll have all the excuse in the world to just take that, those, those sessions, which we'll practice how to use them next week, uh, and just find anyone, anyone to get started with. Because what here, you may start with some people that you're somewhat comfortable with, but it'll help you get the patterns down for now when you don't know someone. And if that's where you need to start, that's great. Maybe you feel more comfortable and you can say, you know, I can find somebody who I don't know, who I think needs to grow. I'm ready, I'm ready to, to take the tools and begin to do that. But we're going to put that tool in your hand. It'll be a set of PDFs. It'll be on our website where you just take that and, and you use that uh, to have your, your uh, meetup times. It's got good questions, has a Bible passage, has a little bit of information about what you should see in that Bible passage, and you can even just study it together while you're sitting there talking. And it's got questions that are going to uh, get you to think a little bit below the surface with one another about how to apply or think about that area of your life. And um, so that's going to be ready. Another tool I would highly recommend, you think, man, I, you know, maybe you're thinking, I've, I've just kind of been hanging out with this person, start, start meeting with somebody, but I haven't known where to start. A book called The Gospel Centered Life. The Gospel Centered Life is an excellent book that does multiple things. It deals with doctrine stuff uh, and articles, and it also helps take the gospel and think about the implications of life. It gives you great discussion questions, and it's really easy to use when you have that. The Gospel Centered Life by something Thune. I should say it's, 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 his last name is Thune, T H U N E. There will be an appendix in the last week at the end that'll have tool recommendations, but it's not when you. Day. But if you want to get a hold of that, it, it's, it's excellent. Uh, the Gospel Centered Life, it, it's followed on by another one called the Gospel Centered Community that has the same same thing, but it talks more about the context of relationships. So those are tools that I would not just say would be sort of okay to use. These are great tools for helping other people grow, for helping you grow. But you need tools. You need to think about what those tools are. There's other ones you could you could use. Uh, basically, the Living Victorious would be a great thing for somebody to sit one-on-one -on -one down with a seven-session biblical counseling and foundation course that begins with the gospel and talks about how to apply that to the problems that you face in life and find biblical hope. That's a, you know, you've got to be good with your tools and comfortable with them so that you can help people see and understand the value, the value of those. But you need good tools. Number one, so in, in your plan, you ought to be able to just go, okay, here's what I'm going to if I were, If I had to disciple a person... And, and create this, initiate this relationship with another person for the first time, I'm going to start with this tool. I got it. I know what it is. Uh, and I feel comfortable using it. So you got to get comfortable with it yourself. Uh, second, put it on the calendar. Nothing gets done in my life. It doesn't get on the calendar. It's just the way it is. What, what, are, the, what are the spaces in your life where you could imagine doing this? Um, that, that's important. And so if you're married and you talk with your spouse, sit down, prioritize the time that you will need to make space in your life to help others grow. Here, here's some key things you can do. Look for places in your calendar that can overlap. Can you add a person to your exercise routine? You think, oh, well, that's a, that, that, that doesn't seem like a disciple should. Okay. Well, it depends on what you do while you're exercising, right? And, and so can, is there other ways that you can overlap and add somebody to, to what you're doing and exercise so you guys can spend time together, be reading stuff apart from one another, having discussions while it's going on? Can you add a person to your exercise routine? Are there some meal times where others can join you? How can you use technology if you cannot be in the same physical place? You know, FaceTime is a real thing, right? Uh, Skype and whatever other old-fashioned things you might be using. <laughs> FaceTime. Uh, you know, those things are all available, but you can sit and it's like you're in in, in a room with somebody. And, and so you might be like, yeah, we can't. We're having trouble syncing up our schedules where we can be in the same place. But you might have a half hour over lunch, you know, once a week. And as long as you've got internet and they've got internet, you got a bowl of salad or something, you can just sit there and you can talk. So think about ways to use technology if you can't be in the same physical place. In our area, parents often spend time sitting in sports fields during practices and can meet with someone at the same time. Probably one of the richest meeting times I could have over the next eight weeks would be if any of you are available Tuesday, Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock to sit at a sports field while my kids run around and play soccer. I could sit there and I could have an hour-long conversation with people. And some of you are thinking, oh yeah, I guess I could do that too. I've been sitting there on Facebook, right, on my phone. But I can, I can 
repurpose that time. Uh, so you got to put it on the calendar and figure out for you how it's going to work. You will only accomplish those things in life that you prioritize on your schedule. Uh, third, initiate communication. I think this is one of the big hangups. Okay, so I want to get started. Get a little awkward. What, you know, how do I get that? How do I get that going? It can be good to think through how you can communicate initially. Uh, as you become aware and as you have a plan, I think it'll be a lot easier to communicate. You, think, hey, you know, I kind of know what I'm gonna do. I know what I want to do to uh, get started. Uh, do you want to write an email, make a phone call, send a text message, talk on the next Sunday? It can be important to think through what you're asking someone to do to get started as well. So, so you want to think about how am I going to communicate? What ways are they fine with communicating? Can I get their email address? And can I, uh, you know, send them an email and say, hey, I'd love to just get together with you. Now, I know I may have a privileged position as a pastor, but nobody has ever gotten mad at me for sending an email or a text message saying, hey, I, can we find a time to hang out? It's not real hard, right? Yeah. Um, you could simply ask someone via all modes of communication. I'm thinking about getting together with one or two people to study the Bible and pray together regularly. Would you be interested in getting together this week to talk about it? Just to talk about what we're going to do? You know, just that, begin your conversation there. And uh, most people are going to be like, let's figure out when the time is. <laughs> and, you know, the truth is, we live in an area like this that where people are starved for real relationships. They really are. And so, like, being initiators serves people in a way that they're, they're incredibly hungry for. I think you'll, you'll find that there are, if you came into the process thinking, who would I be with? You'll find there's, there's so many people that you could that, um, that that's not going to be the problem anymore. Uh, so you, but you need to initiate communication. You want to do that. Get the information you need. Uh, choose a place. When you first get together, it can be good to pick a neutral place to meet up and keep it casual. Many people have not even thought of the possibilities, whether it's coffee shops or Wegmans or home or the gym. Take some time to figure out a few ideas to propose right at the beginning that can make it easy uh, to again to begin meeting up. Um, number three, ask people for contact information. I like this. Go ahead. What is time it? check? Yeah. Oh, time check. Okay. I got it. I got it right here. We're good. We're good to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you how passionate Annie is about the fact that we're doing this. Like the uh, so yesterday, you know, she had me on the deck, and she's just like, "Listen, you need to say this." To make sure you don't forget to talk about this. And people wonder about this. And she's like, going, oh, and I was like, do you want to see what I'm actually going to say? So, <laughs> so we just got it out. I was like, here's the 10 things we're going to talk about basic practices. I was like, I can't rewrite them. They're printed. And they're in the notes. We're going to, I'll try to say, am I saying the things you want to be? Yes, you're doing awesome. You're hitting the bullseye. Am I missing any of the ones you thought? No, no, you're, you're hitting the bullseye. Yeah. Just keep it out of the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three, ask people for contact information. <laughs> Many times the opportunity to have impact in someone's life is there early on after meeting them. Maybe you had a good conversation or were surprised that someone shared a burden or an area of struggle in their life. If you're going to become effective in establishing peer-to-peer -peer discipling relationships, you'll need to take the time regularly to ask people for their basic contact info and follow up with it quickly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not hard to do. We all have devices to write these things down, even if it's a pen paper. Um, but I think it's important that you find ways to, to get contact information from people. If you're going to become effective in this, in this, you have to be able to get in touch with people. Doing so establishes a regular pattern of communication that will allow you to take next steps in getting to know them. Many times God may move in the hearts of people to get more involved encouraging others spiritually and they have no immediate ways to take a next step because they're not gathering the info they need to turn the desire into action. So you meet somebody here who's maybe come for the first time, you have a decent conversation with them, and uh, you know, maybe Tuesday you're thinking, man, that was that's good, I wonder, I wonder who that guy is, and, and how I could help him, or who that girl is, and uh, you know, I, that, that conversation really burned my heart, God's moving me to pray for them, I wish I could, I mean, I can't contact them, no, uh, I wonder if anybody else has their information, well you have the conversation, right, <laughs> you're, the, you're the connection, uh, they may have left the visitor tag, and I will say in a second, as church leaders to connect you with needs. But uh, the truth is, in those moments, you know, we have to be aware of, you know, I need to get this person's contact information. This is a good conversation. I want to be able to follow up uh, after this and maybe see, maybe this is someone God wants to use me in their life. Um, so 
ask people for contact information, people do not mind giving it. Um, can we all just get over the fact that there are some people that are gonna be like, oh no, why are they digging into my life, right? Like, okay, but do you know the percentage of that is incredibly small? Like it's so small that we fail to impact the other 95% of people because we won't take the steps to kind of get over the initiation bridge. Just take the steps and uh, let you know it's fine if we scare 5% of people because they came to a church and people wanted to be deeply involved in their lives. Uh, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, ask church leaders to connect you with needs. Another great practice is to ask church leaders to connect you with people who would benefit from meeting with someone. You know, there is something to say. Uh, if you if you can make church leaders aware and say, I'm ready. I just want you to know, if you run into people who have this challenge or someone in this situation or just anybody who you think, man, they need some one-on-one -on -one time with somebody that's going to help them grow, I'm ready. Put me on that list. Call me as soon as you see that person. Like, having a set of that is just really good. Uh, so you can ask church leaders to connect you with needs. Let the church leaders know what type of situations you feel prepared and equipped to help with and respond quickly when they present you with opportunities. We uh, we don't have a system for this, I just want to say. Like we're just now we're talking about it, we're teaching it. We don't have like a buttoned up like matchup system. This is a little bit Andy was like, are we gonna play the match game? You know, you got a list of people who want to do this, you got some people who are learning how to do it. No, I refuse to there, there's a reason I'm refuse, I'll refuse to do that. Now, we will help you. And if we need to create some sort of system, I don't want discipleship to be a system. Discipleship is not a system. It's about every one of us becoming more aware and desire and increasing in desire to connect with the people that God puts around us. So I don't want a bottleneck system here at the church. I want every member a multiplier. And so it doesn't matter who somebody runs into when they come into our church. They didn't get to meet the pastor. Somebody's going to care about their soul. That's what we want. Um, but we'll try, as, as the vine grows, we'll also try to build the trellis to help that vine continue to flourish. All right? so, uh, so we do think about people. And, and our elders, you know, if we, we sat down on a Monday night and, uh, at, at our meeting and said, who's some people we'd really like to, and who think we need some, need some extra encouragement, uh, or we have opportunity for discipleship, and we can make a list and we can help some people get connected to them and initiate those relationships. Um, Number five, focus on a few. Focus on a few. We often under underestimate the impact that can be made in personal ministry to a few other people around us. We're all tempted to believe that more people can be more effective. The truth is that much of the most important gospel work in individual lives happens in the context of individual conversations and relationships where there's growing trust and understanding. It's in the context of consistent friendship that the challenging words that can be sometimes necessary find the right opportunity. It's in the context of consistent friendship that key insights are discovered that help people grow in new ways. When we focus on helping a few around us grow, we're not just investing in them, we're impacting others through them for years to come. Jesus adopted a similar model for his own earthly ministry. Out of the crowds of people, he selected 12, right? So this is just a Jesus model of thinking about ministry. He spoke to the crowds, he selected 12, but even out of that group of 12, there were three that were able to share in some moments that went beyond the experience of even the other 12. And Jesus came with a strategy for the gospel to reach the nations, and when he began that strategy, he began with just a few. So that should guide the way we think about it. And, and, and for us to see, you know, the impact that I can have begins with, with uh, having a deep impact on other people. And reality is that most of us only have time in our life for, to do this for a few. You know, some of this should inform how we parent and how we care for our children. We should be doing the kind of things that matter in this for our kids. So we're already doing that, right? And uh, encouraging our spouses and, and uh, spiritual growth. And then we're talking about having a few other relationships in our life that we're actively helping that person grow in their faith. So just a few. Create an inner, oh, overcome obstacles. Overcome obstacles. Uh, Pastor Danny Waves from First Baptist Church of Lyons, a big supporting church pillar in our other church plans, regularly explains that we have to believe for others before they believe for themselves. And it doesn't mean that I can have faith for you. By this, he means that an influencer desires and hopes for growth in an individual's life before they can even desire it for themselves. Ministry is about helping people see what God can do in their lives when they have not yet been able to glimpse it with their own eyes. That's what we're talking about. And we see what God could do in this life. 
what, what God can do through this person. And we believe it for them. And, and so, so that's incredibly important. There are often obstacles to seeing people grow in their walk with Christ. Because of these obstacles, the road to maturity is often a bumpy one with many, many opportunities to just give up on one another. When you commit yourself to peer-to-peer -peer discipleship, it will not be long before you be discouraged or faced with the reality that the person you are working with lacks the desire or commitment you would hope that they would possess. We met together once, and I wanted to get together the next time. They didn't show up. They canceled the last three appointments. Uh, you know, I didn't hear from them after my last text. What do I do now? Well, wisely, there may be a time to realize where we need to redirect our energies and efforts. But in almost every situation I've been involved in, I've had to overcome those barriers and obstacles. And we have to know that that's what you're getting into. And so that you don't go, man, I, I, you know, I committed myself to helping this person. I wanted to do it. And they don't seem that interested. Yeah, well, what, they, they just welcome to life, right? Like, this is how it works. You know, you, you're motivated. They're not motivated. They can't see the benefit yet. Be the one who can continue to initiate. There may come a time where you go, you know, I think my time and energy will probably be better focused somewhere else. But... Not after the first obstacle. Overcome obstacles. Create an interdependent environment. I've spoken to this a lot already with the peer-to-peer -peer language. Use language that emphasizes peer-to-peer -peer discipleship. Of course, there are some people who will have maturity to initiate relationships and situations that foster discipleship. Others will not yet be there. And sometimes, though, the language of I'd like to offer to mentor you, you're going to disciple you, can cause unnecessary bed barriers. And I would also say uh, an unhealthy type of Christian relationship. Because that person can help you grow as well. And, and I think it's important. When, sometimes when we go into a relationship thinking, I'm the initiator, I'm the mentor, I'm the thing, we underestimate how much God wants to use that relationship in our lives to, to grow and change us as well. So you should go into any of those initiated relationships with the thoughts, you know, God's going to use this to grow me. And I want it to. And I, this person's going to grow in ways like they have valuable things to say to me. If the Spirit of God is in this person, they also are going to help. God's going to speak to me sometimes through them. So create an interdependent environment. The best of discipleship environments are never one way. In an interdependent environment with a peer-to-peer -peer focus, both people involved in the conversation will both be open to being challenged and grow as they study Scripture together. Um, I'm going to take five more minutes and we're going to roll through this and then uh, see where we get to from there. Uh, I think we'll finish up number eight. And then we'll, we'll close it up. But we want to think a little bit about emphasizing gospel-based motivations for holiness. <laughs> so as you're thinking about that, if you haven't thought about this, this is why I recommended the School of Gospel-Centered Life, because it's great for this. It'll keep it from just being sort of a legalistic challenge fest, you know, where you just said, you know, you're just using discipline to try to get you to a place that your heart isn't yet. Um, you know, there's a there's a role for discipline. We want to see that, but we also want to think about that in the context of the gospel. Um, one of the ways to do that, you know, we were talking about overcoming obstacles. The, the, at the end of these notes, we're not going to study through them all. I gave you an appendix about grace-based sanctification. Grace-based growth, I can't remember what I named it. But it's ten, ten realities that you should think of. Read those passages. Look at what's underlined and think uh, and learn to understand what makes people grow. How can I be confident that if somebody is a Christian that they're going to continue growing so I don't just give up on them? Well, those ten things will help you. Uh, but we need to emphasize gospel-based motivations for holiness. The truth is we're not just helping people become more disciplined or make moral decisions. We want them to experience all the fruits that the gospel of Jesus Christ makes available to them through the union we have with Christ. I don't really want to do this an injustice. 